How's it going guys? This is James Obst for runatonce.com. So you're a professional poker player. You spend way more time away from the tables than anyone else you know. You watch countless videos. You're spending hours evaluating your play at the end of sessions. You eat really well. You make sure you get enough sleep. You practice meditation and yoga. And yet you're still not happy with your level of performance on a day-to-day -day basis. Something's holding you back, whether it's tilt, whether it's just that you can't seem to play your A or B game often enough. And that's what I want to look at today. I want to look at the aspects of your poker game that perhaps don't garner as much attention as, uh, as the others that I've just discussed that could be holding you back from achieving the level of play that you want to see from yourself. So I'm going to focus on three topics today. I'll share with you some anecdotal evidence from my own career to support the points that I try to make. And uh, hopefully at the end of it, you can come out having a bit more of a perspective on other things that might be influencing your, your level of play. So the first topic I want to discuss is about knowing yourself. Now, as we know, over the last couple of years, there's been a huge shift in poker teaching towards what's game theory optimal. It seems like half the videos that come out these days are going into huge detail about how to play your entire range on various streets, how to make sure you're not unexploitable at all, you know, using all these great software tools that are available to, uh, to try to get your poker game as close to game theory optimal as possible and trying to quote unquote solve every poker situation that we find ourselves in. And that's great, that's been a natural progression and uh, it's certainly made the games a whole lot tougher. But from an outside perspective, it's a little concerning that I think uh, people would definitely be getting a little lost in the whole relentlessness of this pursuit of optimal play. I think it can lead to people losing perspective, losing consideration for all the other critical aspects of playing a good poker game. So as you can see that I've written on the slide, there are, as we know, a whole lot of people, sports people, who have made a great living with unconventional technique. Uh, I don't think I have to give you guys many examples of that. We know there are tremendous golfers, top 10 tennis players who have, you know, unsound technically swings or strokes, so unsound that analysts will give them a lot of uh, criticism for it. And yet these people have been enormously successful. Maybe they haven't reached the height of Roger Federer having perfect technique on every stroke and becoming the greatest of all time. but. As poker players, not many of us are going to achieve that. So it's not always realistic to be shooting for having a perfect poker game in terms of you know the technical aspect of it. So what can be more important is to focus on other aspects. And knowing yourself is, for me, a huge one. And I'll tell you guys a bit about, uh, well, I'll give you some examples from my own playing experience. Basically, a few years ago, I well, I've always been aware of it, but I have a higher than average early finish position for regs in tournament poker. Basically, I finish in the bottom 10%, uh, like 9% of the time, according to OPR, and that's quite high for most regs. You see a lot of the a lot of the better regs around five to six, and there's no saying what's actually right or wrong. I mean, if I'm busting more early, that means I'm creating bigger stacks. That means that my win percentage will be higher. So you can't actually say that that's necessarily bad. But what I did is I spent a whole lot of time thinking about this and I can, uh, well, I always realize that my biggest edge as a tournament player comes the deeper the tournament goes. I seem to play my best on the final table. That's when my arousal reaches a good level, um, a conducive level to playing good poker. 
and I definitely was spewing off a few too many stacks or plenty too many stacks in the early stages. That's been, that was kind of a recurrent issue for me for years in earlier in my career. So rather than, you know, trying to analyze every single case of where I spewed off a stack and how I can not make that same mistake again, you've got to realize that everyone's different and that was my overall leak so I had to do something about that overall leak and so one of the big changes I made not long ago and you guys would have seen this from my videos is that at the start when I was making videos for run at once I was changing my raise size based on stacks and trying to play what I thought was you know a more technically correct strategy in terms of raise sizing but what I decided was that I needed to allow myself to get deeper in more tournaments and try to cut back on the early bust outs. So I decided to experiment with min raising from every position in every level. And basically before I did this, I would look at guys min raising with 200 BB stacks under the gun with no antis. I would look at a min raise there and think, Man, this guy doesn't really have much of a clue. What's he? Why would you min raise in that spot? It just obviously isn't right. And yet, my perspective on that has completely changed now. And I still think, you know, if you're playing tight from a tight position, that's probably not technically correct. But the point is, it can be correct for some people if it uh, if it allows you a greater edge as a result from other aspects of your game. And for me, this has really worked. I've uh, increased my ITM percentage an enormous amount, and uh, I, I feel like it's been beneficial, a beneficial change for me. But another, another similar adjustment that I made along the same lines is that, uh, well, first of all, I've probably never been the calmest player when I play. Unfortunately, I tend to ride the swings a little bit too much, and. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate. I'm not the most zen person of all time, that's for sure. So what I noticed or what I've noticed over a long period of time is that when I'm playing, let's say on Sunday on a big day of MTTs, if I bust out of a lot of early tournaments quickly, that tends to bum me out a little bit and um, it has an effect on the way I play the rest of the day. I always seem to play my best if I've got chances, you know, if I've got some stacks here and there. And I would imagine that's the same for a lot of people. No one likes to be down to five tables when, you know, the supersonic's starting or maybe down to three. So the adjustment I, another adjustment I made and, and the min raising help with that was basically I just said to myself, you know what? If we get a really close spot in any of those early tournaments, like a spot where I'm not confident enough to either pull off a big bluff or make a big call, even though I think there might be, you know, plus EV decisions, I'm just going to take the tight approach because it was critical to me that I am aware of my own strengths and weaknesses in my game and that I can adjust my game plan basically for a day like that to maximize my expectation in the long run. Now, I think that, uh, you know, if, if you're burying your head in the game theory optimal type of play, then there's just no way that you would do that. You know, you would never be min raising from every spot. You wouldn't be making those kind of adjustments. You'd be focusing on playing every hand the best that you possibly can, which I think is very important. But I also think this is something that gets overlooked. And I do see on the forums a lot, people are posting about their leaks and how they're struggling to overcome them. So for example, I, I think I read recently a thread where someone was talking about how they're just making too many hero calls on the river and they can't seem to stop it. Even if the logic points them towards a fold, they're repping such a small range and they talk themselves into making these big hero calls. And that's a common leak for a lot of people. I mean, I've struggled with it at times. I know pretty much everyone would have. And so my advice in a situation like this, 
and I'll, I'll compare it to the other advice. Like most of the advice that's given to someone in that situation is, you know, just work really, really hard, maybe practice meditation so that your emotions don't come into play too much and do all these things to make sure you don't, you know, you make better decisions on the river next time. And that's all well and good. That's good advice. However, it still takes a lot of time to implement those changes. Like people don't just change overnight. They don't, uh, you know, you can't just practice meditation. I don't think for a week or two and all of a sudden have your leaks erased from your poker game. I think, um, in that situation, what I'm trying to say is that you might think about making some tight folds on the turn folds that you know to be minus EV. However, the only way that you're not folding on the turn will be higher EV is if you're making good river decisions and you understand yourself that you're not making good river decisions. So yes, it's a bit of a, a stopgap. And in my example, it's exactly the same. My, my adjustments to my own game have been really stopgaps. I intend to get to a position where you know, my mind's so clear and I'm so zen when I'm playing that I can just play every hand on its merits and not have these emotional responses at times. But until we get to that position, it is critical for our win rate to, to be adjusting the way we play based on our own strengths and weaknesses. So that's the point I wanted to make there. And you've seen I've written at the bottom of the slide there about the sorry case of Padraig Harrington. Um, and it truly is a sorry case. I mean, for those guys who don't know him, he won back-to-back -back majors, I think, in around 2008 or so. And I'm not sure if he's won a tournament since. Um, he was always notorious for being um, a perfectionist in terms of the swing. He would analyze video of his swing and always be trying to change, tinker with something. And it, does it make sense that he would try to improve, try to change his swing after winning back-to-back -back majors? Well... I guess in a lot of ways it obviously doesn't, but some people are so just driven by the idea of being perfect, of maybe he wanted to be better than Tiger Woods or whatever it might be. And I think that really hinders success for a lot of people.